Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to VUST Seoul 2021. I, I'm Jung and I'll be your host today. Before we start, please let me check if you can hear me well. Give me a yes in the chat box. If you can hear me well, please. Thank you, everyone. So see that we are all good to start. This free webinar series is held by VUS with the participation of ELT experts and invited speakers from well-known publishing houses, such as Cambridge University Press, Cambridge Assessment English, eFuture, Macmillan Education, MM Publications, National Geographic Learning, Oxford University Press, StudyCat, and VUS. We hope to bring you the most updated ELT trends and practical teaching methods and techniques so that you can teach your class more effectively. Before we start, it's my pleasure to announce the lucky pro winners from the last webinars on Tuesday. These winners were randomly selected among those who completed the feedback after the webinar last Tuesday. So the winners are Shen, Lady Hui. Congratulations on this. So VUS are the sponsor will contact you for the prize PC. So please check your mailbox regularly. Each of you will receive a combo of free readers and MM publications. Let me know if you can hear me well. Please type in yes in the chat box. All right, excellent, excellent. All right, a lot of yes. I've never seen so many yes before in my life. <laughs> All right, um, let me first um, share my screen um, to make sure that everyone can see this. All right, um, so please let me know if you can see my screen. Um, hello, Trung. Trung ơi, please help. Can you see my screen? Yes, I can see it, Ms. Go. All right, excellent. Uh, all right, everyone. Um, it is such an honor for me um, to have the opportunity to be here today and, and talk to you. I hope that after my talk today, you can take away some interesting thoughts and useful tips that you can apply in your professional development journey. Um, let me show you the agenda of my talk. So I'll touch on some theoretical knowledge and we'll also provide you with um, practical ideas in the last section. During my talk, I'd love for us to be interactive. So I'll ask you to answer my questions along the way to keep us on awake and engaged in today's topic. The platform that I use for these interactive questions are Mentimeter. So please take your mobile phone and scan the QR code on the screen. So, so I suppose the QR code is on the screen right now and please use your mobile phone to scan it. Um, 
I will also send you the, uh, the link by the chat box. So for those of you um, who are not able to see or scan the QR code, then so that's that. All right, let me see. Um, I don't I have I don't have the access to the chat box for some weird reason. Um, let me see if I can. Oops, no. <laughs> I certainly don't want to leave the webinar. Anyway, um, please let me know if, if you can um, scan the QR code and if you are in the Mentimeter platform. Um, Zhong Oi, I think I need your help with this as well. Please see yes. if you can, can log in um, Mentimeter. Yes, I can. All right. Uh, could you help to see in the chat box if, if uh, the participant can log in or not? Yeah, lots of them are in the website already. Oh, excellent. All right. So it's my phone then. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, I'm not going to keep you any longer. Um, so you are now on the platform. You can also see uh, the content of my presentation on, on the screen um, right now. So I will start my, the, my, uh, my talk. All right, in online teaching, uh, from my observation, our conversations usually begins with which tools or apps we should use to teach online. Of course, teachers need um, technology, techniques, and subject matter expertise to teach well. But I would argue that everything fails without the presence of the heart, the passion, and the inspiration of the teacher. In fact, in 2017, in their case study of six online teachers with high student evaluation, Orcutt and Dringertz confirmed that it is the teacher's active interest and passion that can greatly increase student engagement and intellectual curiosity. From my experience observing hundreds of online classes, I have seen um, teachers who know massive technology but they don't really think about how or how much technology should be integrated into a lesson. And then they go to teach and throw loads of technology into the students. But when we think about it, how much learning is taking place? What I mean by honoring, honoring the teacher's heart in online teaching is that we should acknowledge the important role of the teacher. The teacher should play a more important role or in other words, more essential role than technology in student online learning journey. Um, online teachers should be encouraged to teach with the heart, with the devoted attitude and passion, rather than just teaching with plenty of online tools or apps. Now, I would like to clarify that I'm not saying that a teacher teaching with technology is not teaching with the heart. The point is we teach with technology, but we need to constantly think about what we are teaching and consider the impacts of technology on students' learning outcomes. Now, the question is, how can we teach with the heart? That can be a very difficult question to answer, but in my humble opinion, I would like to make a strong claim that is reflection is one of the key components for us to teach with the heart. Why do I say so? I will prove to you my answers throughout my talk today. But 
Before that, let's spend a minute or so to discuss my first question to you. That is what, that is in your opinion, what is reflection? So please go to your, uh, your mobile phone and, oops, I'm sorry. Um, let me sit, all right. And please answer the, the first question. Um, in your opinion, what is reflection? Please type in your answers on your mobile phone. Um, maybe it's the, uh, the Wi-Fi connection that, that the questions hasn't been appeared yet. So let me... I think um, the question has to be loaded on my side before. Uh, yeah, I, I believe it's in on your on your mobile phone right now. Uh, yes, I think the button need to refresh. The page. If you cannot see the question on your mobile phone screen, please refresh the page. Thank you. Thank you, Zhang. So please spend a few minutes to type in your answer. Oh, I can see the first answer already, realization. Thank you. Excellent, the act of con contemplating and self-assessing. Wow, excellent. Deep thoughts, think about what you have done, reaction improvement. Teacher should look back at on how he or she approached the lesson, deep and critical thinking about what you have done. I really like that. Um, careful thought. Oops. Uh, I need to go back to the slide. All right. There you are. Hmm, okay. All right, thanks a lot for, for your answers. Um, that's very interesting, very useful answers. Many, many, many good answers as well, I think. Um, so actually in the field of teaching in general and EOT in particular, there are different definitions of reflection. To serve the purpose of my talk today, I'd like to summarize the definition of reflection as follows. So the key concept here is that reflection is a systematic process. So when we reflect, we think critically about our lesson to solve problems and to make improvements. For example, if a lesson went well, we can describe it and be clear about why it was successful so that we can replicate our success in the future lessons. Or if the student didn't understand a particular language point that we have just introduced, we need to think about what we did and why it may have been unclear. Or if the students are misbehaving, we need to think about what they were doing when, why, and what we could do to improve the situation. So the message I'd like to deliver here is that the reflection is a good thing that teachers should do, and it can enable us to teach with the heart. But what exactly are the benefits of reflection? I'd like to show you a short video clip in which um, three teachers shared why they think reflection is beneficial. They will also discuss how they feel reflection benefits their students. So let's watch uh, these video clips together. Instead, I place more focus on reflection. Uh, sorry, can, can you hear me well? Can you hear the sound, I mean? Yes, Ms. Do, yes. Yeah, excellent, John, thank you. Reflecting on the individual needs of each student no two students are the same, so how can we expect two lessons to work out the same? 
When you become aware of your students' preferences and strengths, you can tailor to their needs. And so they are more curious and more equipped to explore more deeply. The more I reflected on my lessons and made changes, the more students seem to enjoy and engage with the topic and even with me. Firstly, it gives me opportunity to think about what causes my lessons to succeed or to fail in order to work out a solution and get rid of any negative. Oops, I think I just clicked something. Negative Sorry. Things. Another thing is, through a lot of reflection, I learned that a fantastic lesson plan might work for particular classes, but not for the others. And then I should tailor my lesson plans to particular classes, cultures, and learning styles. On top of that, I can come up with even more engaging activities through this process and new ideas come through it. And as for my students, they can be taught the way they learn. They benefit from a good lesson and positive energy a teacher can bring to them. In some respects, teaching in my eyes is like selling a product and reflection is quite equivalent to getting customers' reactions and reviews and making appropriate changes. For myself as a teacher, it is when I can look closer at my teaching staff and materials, I might want to reorganize or edit or replace them. And these improvements enable me to feel more confident the next time I go to the classroom. I believe that my students can recognize the changes too. Um, they know that I have listened to their feedback and they will have a more comfortable experience with a teacher who is always looking for improvements. All right, so, so we have just listened to some teachers' opinion about the benefits of reflection. I'm interested in knowing your idea. I'd like to hear from you. So let me uh, reload this. Could you list out one benefits of reflection on Mentimeter? If the screen work well, <laughs> I hope. There you are. So please type in your um, responses and, and then click submit. Again, please refresh your page and then you can see the next question. Thank you, Don. Oh, lots of interesting things. Uh, flexibility, better lessons, self-assessment, self-improvement, you know what you reflect the student, check out the knowledge, self-improvement, or more effective lesson. Awesome, awesome. Awesome. All right, so we could see that when we reflect upon our lesson, uh, we are more critical and we aim to fix problems or to make improvements. So we no longer teach by impulse, intuition, or routine. Our strengths and areas for improvement are being identified, thereby chances for improvement can follow and continuous improvement can be achieved. In other words, if a teacher reflects on his or her lesson, he or she, sorry, he or she is trying to be better and actually trying to teach with the heart. So I have shared with you what I mean by honoring the teacher's heart. We have defined reflection and discussed the benefits of reflection. Now the question is how can we create meaningful reflection so that we can be better and help students achieve learning outcomes? I will have you answer these questions in the following section. In order to create meaningful reflection, we will need to go through the reflection process. In the literature, there are several uh, reflection process models that are often cited. For example, Sean models focusing on reflection in action and reflection on action. 
Cobb's learning cycle in 1984 and later Gibbs reflective cycles in 1998. Within the short time that we have and to serve the purpose of my talk today, I'd like to simplify the reflection process like this. So the process starts with we go and teach in our class. Then we gather and record the data. That is to say what happened in our lesson. Then we evaluate and analyze the data that we have. Finally, we draw conclusions based on the data and then make decision of what we should do before we start teaching again. For example, teacher A taught a lesson and he could feel that his student didn't really participate in a debate as a speaking activity toward the end of the lesson. He then decided to look back at his lesson and collect information related to his teaching steps, student reactions, and what he said in his instructions, for example. He then move on to evaluate and analyze the data in order to find out the reason for the student's disengagement. Then he needs, needs to make um, decisions on what he could do differently in his next lesson to conduct the activity more successfully. So we could see that reflection requires us to think hard and dig deep in our teaching practices so that we can recognize our problems and the causes to our problems. Reflection will also enable us to make plans on what we could do to improve. I have a few questions that I would like us to discuss about the reflection process. The first question is, uh, let me try to reload it. So I think um, it doesn't work on Mentimeter, so I might need to, oops, sorry, reload the page a little bit then. All right, there you are. So my first question is that, is re, do you think that reflection a non-cyclical process? That means that you only need to do it once. Interesting answer. Some of you say yes. A lot of you, a lot of you say no. Well, actually, um, reflection is a cyclical process. So we repeat the stages again and again. So we teach, we look back at our lesson, um, we analyze the data, we make decision of what we are going to do in our next lesson, we teach again, and we start the cycle again and again. All right, thank you for your answers. Well, a lot of you still, a lot of you still agree and say no, and uh, some of you maybe it's, it's uh, you just answers your, uh, you give your answers a little bit late than the others. But anyway, the answers is reflection, it's a cyclical process. All right, let's start with my next questions. Um, let's see if it works this time. If it still doesn't work, I can still have the solution to it. All right, my next question is, when do you think reflection can be done? Can it be done before a lesson, during a lesson, after a lesson or any time? Interesting, some of you say during lesson, some of you say, most of you say any time, some of you say after a lesson, Awesome. So we could see that a lot of you have said 
that reflection can be done at any time. Actually, that's the correct answer. Reflection can be done either before, during, or after a lesson, meaning anytime. So we reflect before a lesson by, by thinking about whether the technology, for example, whether the technologies we are planning to use is useful or is it going to confuse our students? We may want to think about whether the activities that we are planning to use are stimulate enough. Sorry, whether, whether the activities that we are planning to use are stimulating enough um, to, to give the student the opportunity to practice the target language effectively in real life context. Um, we may also reflect uh, during um, our lesson as well, I believe. We think about whether our students are facing any difficulties with the language point that we have just introduced so that we can provide solution immediately. Or we may think about whether our students are working on their speaking tests in the breakout rooms on Zoom. Most of the time, we reflect after we teach a lesson. We think about whether we did a good job, right? If not, what was the problems and how we can improve the situation in our next lessons? So in general, we can do reflection. We can have reflection at any time. Another question regarding the um, reflection process that I would like to ask you is, Um, sorry, uh, but it's because of technology. So it's a little bit, it takes a little bit of your time. All right, so my next question is, do we have to implement changes after our reflection? Please select yes or no. All right, so we can see the answers here. Still different ideas, right? Some, a, a few of you say no, many of you say yes. Let's wait for a few, like two or three more seconds. Well, actually, we don't necessarily um, have to implement changes after our reflection when we decide that what we have been doing is good already. I believe that as teachers, we do need to celebrate our success sometimes and be confident that we are doing a good job. Yes, in general, we may need to change this and that. We may have to... Um, improve our teaching practice. We may need to improve how we instruct the student, or we may need to improve on how to create or ask concept checking questions to make sure that the student understand um, the concept that we are teaching. But we do, sometimes we have good lessons, right? Um, then we need to celebrate it. Sometimes we don't need to make changes um, after our reflection. We may just want to decide to keep what we have been doing well. All right, to, to summarize a little bit, reflection process is cyclical. So we repeat the stages of a reflection process again and again. The process can be done anytime. We can do it before, during, or after a lesson. And reflection is aimed for making changes and continuous improvement but a teacher does not necessarily implement changes after every reflection if we decided that what we have been doing is good already. So let's review the stages of the reflection process. So imagine that you have taught a lesson. Do you remember what the next stage in the reflection process is? Please type in your answers in the chat box. After we teach, in order to conduct the reflection process, what do you think we should do? Excellent. We need to, we need to collect data. Yes, gather and record the data, collect data. 
Excellent. All right. Um, thank you. The next stage of the reflection process is we need to gather and record the data. That is to say what happened in our lesson. Now I would like to take you to explore the methods we could use to gather and record data in more details. So there are different methods that, that we can use to gather and record data for reflection. I'd like to suggest four useful and practical ways that we can use to do this, to do um, to gather and record data for reflection. Um, I would like to emphasize that these methods are mainly for post-lesson reflection. Before we go on into the details of, about how we can create write, written or audio journal, how we can make use of video recording of our lesson, how we can arrange peer observation and obtain student feedback, uh, please help me answer the next questions. All right, let me put the next questions on Mentimeter. All right, my next questions to you is, do you keep a journal or blog? Very interesting results. Now, for the first time ever, more no answers than yes. <laughs> Very interesting, right? All right, I believe we do have different reasons why we keep a journal or blog and why we don't do this. All right, thank you for your, for your responses. So basically writing journals or blocking has been used by hundreds and thousands of teachers to gather and record data for reflection. Here are some examples for you to see. Writing journal or blog, either online or in, in notebooks can be a great tool for us to gather and record data for reflection because it gives us a private, secure and safe place to record our thoughts, to record our data and reflection. It also acts as an archive of our classroom experiences for future reference. There are plenty of free online tools now for us to use to create a um, written journal. For example, you may want to have a look at WordPress, Penzu or Weebly. These websites are very user friendly and their instructions to create journals are very easy to follow. Or you may want to think about having an audio journal to gather and record data for your reflection. You can do that on Padlet or Flipgrid. Later in my talk, I will also quickly demonstrate how you can create an online um, audio journal on Padlet and Flipgrid. Now the question is, what data should we gather and record in our journal or blog? If you notice that you have done something well, it worth noting down what you did in your lesson. Describe what happened, how the student reacted, what you said in your instructions, etc. If you try something that doesn't work well, note down as soon as you can what you wanted to do and what actually happened. It also worth noting down your feelings as well, because very often it is your feelings that can be the cause or causes to your actions and the students' reactions. Basically, you may want to answer um, the common WH question words, who, what, when, where, and how. At this stage, you don't need to focus on answering the why questions that can be done in the later stage. There have been some suggestions from ELT expert about what specific questions that you should answer when you gather and record data for reflection. I have collected the questions from these experts as a free resource 
to share with you. I will send you the document via the chat box toward the end of my talk. So if you think that this is useful, so make sure that you don't miss this out. So we are discussing having an online journal or blog. My questions for you is, um, let's see, try to make this work faster. So my next question for you is what can be the challenges for a teachers to write a reflective journal or blog? I can see some responses now on the screen. Oh, somebody talk about your emotion. Yeah, I'm interested to know more about that. Um, the challenges can be, it's, it can be time consuming. Ah, interesting. You don't have the patience to write as well. Yes, I totally agree with, with your concerns. Let's face it, as teachers, we are very busy sometimes and we don't have much time to write down our thoughts in our journal. We don't have much time to reflect. I'd like to, um, however, I'd like to suggest some, something that, that may help you to ease your concerns. For example, you may want to make use of some checklists of good teaching practices and compare what you did in your lessons against these checklists in your journal. Excuse me. Um, Bring, Bring Hort and his college in 2011, or Nielsen and Goodson in 2021, suggest that good, a good online teachers need to possess at least three abilities to teach online or to deliver a good online lesson. The first ability is the ability to foster student engagement. That is to say whether or not you have the ability to maintain student attention and their engagement throughout the lesson. The second ability that a good online teacher should have is the ability to stimulate student intellectual development. That is to say the ability to ask questions mm -hmm. in order to help students to improve their high order thinking skills, such as creativity or critical thinking. The third ability that a good online teacher should have is the ability to build rapport with students. So you may want to have a checklist like this and compare what you did in your lesson with the checklist in your journal. It's quick and easy. All you need to do is just tick what you have managed to achieve and then later focus on what you have not yet been able to obtain. I will also share with you this checklist as a free resource at the end of my talk. So don't miss this out. Another way to save time is to make use of audio journal by recording what you have observed in your class via audio recording tools available online. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend you to, to record your thoughts on your mobile phone because it may not be easy to save uh, the data in chronological order or putting them in categories. I'd like to quickly to demonstrate how we can navigate on Padlet or Flipgrid to record data for reflections. And by the way, these two platforms are free. So on Padlet, we just need to create different columns for different classes. When we want to create a new entry, recording our thoughts of a particular class, we just need to click on the plus icon here. Mm -hmm. We then need to click on the extra function 
that is the three dots here to access the recording function. We can choose either to make audio recorder or use the video recorder to um, gather and record our data. So for example, if you click on the audio recorder, then you click the microphone, then you can save your thoughts up to 15 minutes. And then you can replay the recording to listen to your beautiful voice. Flipgrid is the same. You can do the same thing on Flipgrid. Um, we can arrange different classes to, to store different data, data for our reflection. For example, if I want to um, have a reflection about my YI7 Monday class, and I just click on that, and then I can choose the function record a response, and then choose the function mic only, and then I can start recording my thoughts. One more suggestion I'd like to make is that um, to save time, you may just want to spend 10 minutes per day to write quick notes in your journal. You may want to focus on just one thing you will keep in your lesson and you will repeat that in your next lesson or one thing you will skip not doing again in your next lesson or one thing you will change in your next lesson. When we write our journal, I think it's a good idea if we try to be confident and trust ourselves. This attitude is actually what Dewey and Rogers call directness. And according to these scholars, directness is a prerequisite attitude that a good reflective teacher should have in order to create meaningful reflection. You need to trust your experience with your students without worrying about the judgment of others, without worrying whether your thoughts are right or wrong. You just need to believe in yourself and write down what you think about your lesson in your journal. So we have just discussed the first method to gather and record data for reflection. Before moving on to the second method, I'd like to ask you another question. All right, sorry, um, I'm a little bit clumsy with technology today, so uh, takes a little bit of time. All right, my next question to you is, have you ever recorded a, um, a lesson of yourself? Oh, okay. Right, so my question is, have you ever recorded your lesson for self-review? Or I think if, if you cannot see the questions on Mentimeter, then just feel free to um, type in the chat box. All right, so some of you say, yes, you recorded a lesson for self-review. Excellent, excellent. Um, I think that I believe that having a video recording of your lesson can be beneficial because you can see things that you may not have seen while you were busy teaching. I will tell you a quick story of one of my teachers um, I have worked with before, Mr. D. Uh, what, he once received my feedback about his online class as he might need to work on how to involve more of his students in whole class discussions. 
Mr. D decided to record the next meeting of his class for self-reflection improvement. After watching the recording, Mr. D noticed that he was neglecting some of his students during class discussion because he tended to be drawn on the most talkative students. He didn't notice some of his students were actually raising their hands on Zoom to, to be called on, but he just noticed the, stu the other student. So, so the student who were actually raising their hands were not called on to participate in the discussion. <laughs> Excuse me. In addition, Mr. D realized that he didn't give his student enough time to formulate a response after he answered questions. On the recording, several students uh, of, in his class were seen, um, they were considering to answer his questions, but Mr. D called on another student before more students could formulate a response. So Mr. D was totally unaware of the problems why he was busy teaching until he watched the video recording of his lesson. With online teaching, it's now very easy to have a video recording of your lessons. You may want to use the, oh, also another benefits of video recording is that you can reflect at your own pace as well. Um, what I would like to suggest is that it's now easy um, that you can um, video record your lesson. You may want to use the recording function on Zoom, or you may want to make use of the free online tools uh, such as VMaker or Screencast or Matic to screen record your lesson. Now, when you decide to make a video record of your lesson, you might need to be careful that your student might not act naturally when they are aware that they are being recorded or you may need to ask for your student consent before you hit the recording button. Mm -hmm. So we have just discussed the first two methods that you may want to use in order to gather and record data for reflection. Mm -hmm. We are now moving on to the third method. That is peer observation. With online teaching, it is now very easy to arrange for a college to observe your class, right? Um, the benefits of having a college to observe your class and give you feedback are things you may have not noticed before, either positive or negative, can be noticed and discussed on. The peer observation can help you to look at your teaching from a different angle. Both you and your college may be inspired by each other, by what you can see and discuss um, in your lesson. You may want to invite your college to observe you in real-time teaching, or he or she can have a delay observation by the screen recorded files. Regarding what to observe in the peer observation, you may want to ask your college to observe and note down everything that you did in your lesson, or you may want to think about some peer observation activity such as you may want to get your college to observe you and note down what surprise inspired, amused, or confused him or her. After the peer observation, you too can help a resourceful discussion about the data and reflect on that. Or your college may just need to look at your questions, the questions that you use to ask the student in your lesson to see if you could manage to stimulate intellectual development for your students. Peer observation may not always come with nice results, unfortunately. Let's face it. Um, so what do you think can be a challenge when we reflect with a peer? That's my next question for you. When you have a college observing you, what do you think can be the challenge when we reflect with him or her? Please type in your answers in the chat box. So you may have different perspective. You, oh, Brandon said, you may hurt feelings. You may feel um, less confident. You may have intimidation as well. Absolutely true. 
Richard said criticism might be helpful or hurtful. I totally agree with that. You will become more conscious about your teaching. Yes, yes, all right. All right, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for, for your responses. Very interesting answers. So it is important to note that when we arrange peer observation together and record data for reflection, we need to be open to new ideas. This is what Dewey and Rogers call open-mindedness. It is our willingness to um, appreciate different point of views and analyze our experience without having prior conclusion in mind. Mm -hmm. Selecting the right college to observe you in your class is also important, right? It's best if you can ask for help from someone that you trust. As the experience, of course, like you said in the chat box, sometimes it can make you feel vulnerable. Sometimes you may feel hurt because of the feedback. Um, constructive criticism then is essential, of course, as you don't want to be criticized severely. Why having a friend coming into your class, observing you, but and then give you feedback just for the sake of giving feedback isn't very helpful, is it? So we are coming now to the last method that I, I would suggest you to use together and record data for reflection. Um, that is collecting student feedback. I'd like to ask you to answer me one more question. What feelings do you often have when you collect and receive student feedback? Please type in your answers in the chat box instead of going to Mentimeters because I think it's having a problem right now. So again, the question is, what feelings do you often have when collecting and receiving student feedback? You may feel glad, you may feel disappointed. Uh, yes, interesting, appreciative, curious, nervous, sad, surprised, curious, disappointed, motivated, but so, um, happy. Wow, a lot of feelings. <laughs> Sometimes shocked. <laughs> maybe you are shocked because of you have good results, or maybe you are shocked because of all your hard work turned out to be very negative, right? All right, excellent. Excellent, yes. I mean, asking students to give you feedback doesn't sound like a tempting option to follow sometime. If you have negative feedback, it can be very discouraging, can it? However, if you show your students that you want to hear from them and care what they think or feel about your lesson, your student can certainly feel that you care and that you are trying to be better and that you want to teach them with the heart. Another benefit is that their feedback can confirm or correct your thoughts or beliefs about your lesson. They can help you to reflect on what you have been doing. With online teaching, it's quite easy to collect student feedback. For example, you may want to get young learners with limited language ability to share with you how they are feeling toward a particular activity by getting them to choose corresponding response, um, corresponding reactions on Zoom. Right, it's that very quick and easy. Or you can get teenage or adult students to vote for their favorite activities on Padlet. I think it's maybe a good idea if we try this out together. So imagine now you are a student in my class. You are, all of you are students in my class. I'd like you to vote for the methods of gathering and recording data for reflection that you like. So, Please scan the QR code on the screen and, and then go to my Padlet to vote for your favorite methods. All right, I will also uh, try to share the, uh, the link on chat box, on the chat box as well. Thank you very much, 
do what's that, that sound? I will, sorry, John. Sorry, what was that sound, Mr. Uh, that's the sound of the answers on my Padlet. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, maybe I will turn this off then. I was busy um, uh, sharing screen, so. <laughs> Oops. All right, so uh, can you see the screen now, John? The Padlet? Yes, it's yeah. there. Right, okay. Can you see the Padlet on, on the screen? Yes, yes, I can. All right, all right. So we can see the vote here. Oh, a lot of you uh, have chosen student feedback. Wow, right. Um, not many of you selected audio journal. Quite a lot of you have chosen written journal as well. Very interesting. So you really like student feedback. Oh, excellent. Although sometimes you may get um, unexpected results, right? All right. Interesting, very interesting. All right, let's go back to, um, to our present presentation. All right, so I believe that you can sh see uh, the screen right now. So what do you do when you have the, uh, the results on your Padlet? You can do, um, so when you have the results, now you may want to work on why um, your, some activities are very um, interesting and engaging for a student, why your student like this and not that. And then you work on the data to reflect on what you need to do next, right? Um, right, so you can do the same activity on Padlet with your student to collect their feedback. Or when you have students with more language ability, you may want to use Google Forms to collect their feedback on what they like and don't like about your teaching. I have also included uh, this form in the free resource, which I'm going to share with you at the end of my talk. All right, so if you think this is beneficial, the Google Forms, then make sure that you don't miss this out at the end. Um, I think that some people are still working on a Padlet. Um, let's return to my presentation and you can explore Padlet later. Is that okay? All right, so I would like to make a few more suggestions regarding using student feedback as one of the tools to um, reflect. Um, we need first, I think that we need to be courageous. If we really want to be better, we will have to face the chance of receiving negative feedback sometimes. Excuse me, Ms. Do, maybe you, you need to switch to the PowerPoint slides then. Oh, okay, sorry. Mm -hmm. Oh, because you cannot see the screen that I sh share, right? Yes, I'm seeing the Google Chrome now. All right. All right, can you see the screen now? Is still the Zoom screen from the website. It's not the PowerPoint slides yet. Uh, 
from my side, it's the PowerPoint slide. So maybe you just stop share and then share it again. All right, that's a good idea. Resume share. Can you see the screen now? Not yet. Ah, okay, stop sharing. All right, there you are. Okay, Sorry. it's good now. Sorry, everyone. So uh, what I mean is that when you collect student feedback, you will need to be courageous, right? If we want to be better, we will have to face the chance of receiving negative feedback sometimes. We will also need to, to try to obtain what Dewey and Rogers call wholeheartedness. Sorry, that is, I think that is presenter view with the notes. So can you make the screen a bit bigger? We see the notes along the side. Ah, so. Okay. <laughs> All right. So um, let's see. Let me stop sharing. Um, I would need to select the uh, right thing here. Is it okay now? Yes, it's okay. All right, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, what I would like to say is that we might might try need to try to obtain what Dewey and Rogers call wholeheartedness. It is the unconditional positive regard for our student. We need to keep learning more about our student and their learning, and we need to maintain the need to hear from them. Um, lastly, I think uh, we need to collect student feedback regularly so that we can obtain valid data for um, our reflection. So I have to share with you four methods you may want to try out to gather and record data for reflections. One note is that it may be a good idea to incorporate these methods together instead of, use, instead of using them separately. So for example, you may want to note down in your journal what you have done well, and then you go on watch the video recording of your lesson or collect student feedbacks to verify. So we teach a lesson, we gather and record the data. Do you remember what the next stage in the reflection process is? Please type in your answers in the chat box. So we teach, we gather and record data. What do we need to do next? Excellent. Yes, we will need to evaluate and analyze our data, right? Okay. Right, so analyze, analyzing and evaluate the data to reflect is the stage when you want to focus on answering the questions of why, how, and what you can do to improve. If you teach, um, if you taught a good lesson, think about why you think you were successful. How can you replicate the success? If something didn't go well in your lesson, think about why you think that wasn't successful and what you can do to improve. The negative or positive feelings that you had in your lesson are worth thinking about as well. Why you had those feelings and what impacts do these feelings cause on your action or student reactions, etc. When you have the answers to the above mentioned questions, it is advisable that you discuss what you have just discovered with a critical college that you trust or joining a reflective group because collaborative reflections is more likely to help you to facilitate meaningful changes as without external input from other people, we may just see what we wanna see. For those of you who have been working at VUS or who are still working at VUS, you probably are very familiar with the sharing sections that are often taken places at our campuses. I believe that the sharing sections 
are often are very useful for our teachers because it can help teachers to think back of their teaching practices. They can help each other to analyze and evaluate the data to reflect and make improvement in their classes. If where you are teaching, this does not happen, I would strongly recommend you to make suggestion to your direct managers, or if I'm lucky enough today, um, if you are an academic manager attending my sections, then please think of having a reflective group or holding seven sections for your student at your school. Of course, when we join in a reflective group like this, trust and constructive criticisms are essential, just like in peer reflection we have just discussed before. So we are coming to the last stage of the reflection process. So what is the last stage of the reflection process, everybody? I guess everybody know uh, and still remember that we need to draw conclusions based on the data that we have and then make decision of what we should do next. Now, this is the state where we don't want to make wrong conclusions based on wrong assumptions. Mm. In order to do so, we need to be confident that our conclusion is based on true facts. The ladder of inference can help us understand the thinking steps that lead us to jump to wrong conclusion and so help us to get back to the objective facts. The ladder of inference was first put forward by an organi organizational psychologist, Chris Arigitz in 1970. I'd like to clarify that the original ladder of inference um, is more complicated than the one you are seeing on the screen right now. But to serve the purpose of my talk, I would like to simplify the uh, ladder of inference just like this. Now we are at the top rung of the ladder the conclusion stage. We may want to work our way down the ladder, analyzing our thought process at each rung by answering the questions such as whether our conclusion is sound or not, whether our assumptions is valid and based on what data, have we selected the data rigorously? And finally, are there any other facts that we should consider? So when, when we reach the bottom of the ladder, we know which facts we should rely on. Now we work our way back up the ladders using the right facts to reach the right conclusions. I'd like to give you an example um, to clarify my points a little bit more. So teacher A, after reflecting a lesson, he decided that he wasn't going to choose debates as a speaking activity for his class. He assumed that his student didn't like debating because his student looked inactive and bored. The facts that Mr. A observed in these activities were that his student didn't say much and many of them struggled to express their ideas. Mr. A then realized that if he just looked at part of the facts, then he missed out a very important information. Many of his students struggle expressing their ideas because he didn't teach them how to express disagreement in debates. So his student didn't know how to say, I don't, uh, sorry, I don't agree with you because blah, 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 for example. Mr. A assumption then become his students struggle because they didn't know the language to say. He then make the conclusion that is he need to teach them the expression of disagreement before starting the debate again. So Mr. D, Mr. A carry on his next lesson, trying to, to teach his student the expression of disagreement before he let them join in the debate. Then his lesson and particularly the debate activity turned out to be a successful one. So you could see that if we can make use of the ladder of inference, walk our way down the ladder, choose the right facts, then we may come back again with the right assumption to make the right conclusions. Now I have come to the end of my talk and I would like to summarize the key messages that I would like to, I have delivered in my talk today. 
teaching with the heart is more important than teaching with plenty of tools or apps without considering the impacts of technology on student learning outcomes. To teach with the heart means that we have to constantly reflect on what we have been doing on our teaching practices. To collect reflection data, we have plenty of methods we could make use of. And when we analyze and evaluate our reflection data, uh, we might need to do that with a critical colleague or reflective or a reflective group. And remember, when you draw conclusion or make decisions before coming to your class to teach again, you need to make sure that your conclusion, our decision, and decision are based on true facts. I would like to encourage you to start reflecting by thinking about your last lesson. Think about what went well, what didn't go well. What are the reasons for your success or your problems? And then you may want to think about how you are going to analyze and evaluate the data and whether you will decide to implement changes or not. So that's the end of my talk today. Um, with a lot of problems with technology. <laughs> I hope that um, you have been able to um, take away some interesting thoughts and useful tips that you can apply in your professional development journey. Thank you for uh, listening and thank you for your time. I think now it's um, the time for uh, Q&A, right? All right. Yes, I see that there are four questions in the Q and A, Mr. Uh, all right. Thank you, Jung. Uh, the first question I could see is that um, from Mr. Min Thuong, um, can you show me some key attitude that are necessary in order for teachers to stay reflective? Um, all right. So as I mentioned along the way, when we talk about gather and uh, record our data for reflection. Um, there are, Dewey and Rogers suggest that there are six attitudes that are necessary in order for us to stay reflective. The first one is about um, directness. So you need to be um, confident and trust yourself in your teaching. The second attitude is um, open-mindedness when you um, discuss the data with your, your college, then you, you need to be open to new ideas and appreciate different points of view. Um, and another attitude that are necessary is responsibility. So you need to be responsible for your teaching. Right. Um, the, uh, so I have just mentioned three attitudes. The fourth attitude uh, from Dewey and Rogers, um, that is wholeheartedness. It is the unconditional positive regard for your student. You always have the, the, the eagerness to learn about your student, to get to understand them. So that's about wholeheartedness. And Curiosity is also an important attitude that Rogers emphasized on. So you, you always need to be curious about how others are, feel, are thinking about you, how your students think about your teaching, then you keep on reflecting on your teaching. Uh, so we have uh, directness, wholeheartedness, open-mindedness, um, curiosity, uh, responsibility. Right. So those are the key attitudes that um, Dewey and Rogers have suggested there. So that's not my knowledge. That's from what I, I have read about. I hope that I have um, answered your questions. Mr. Bin Thuong, thank you for um, the interesting questions. Um, another uh, question from um, anonymous attendees. Um, can you show me the connection between self-monitoring and self-reflection? Well, um, I think they are kind of the same and kind of different in a way. Um, when you have self-monitoring, monitoring, it's just you looking at your teaching. Uh, you can do that while you are teaching or after you taught a lesson. What well, self-reflection is when you write it down in your journal, for example, um, but journal can be shared with other people. 
then self-reflection is more about digging, digging deeper into um, your teaching through the reflection process. I mean, what self-monitoring might just stop as looking at things that you have. What self-reflection can push you further by like digging deeper into the reflection process. When you go through the stages of the reflection process, then you are actually um, being clearer and being more critical about your teaching. So I hope I have answered your questions there. Another question from, uh, well, I'm not sure I, pro I will pronounce your name correctly. Amir Asmaili. Oh, sorry, if I pronounce it um, incorrectly. Um, what's your advice for a teacher who would love to teach from the heart, passionately and reflectively to sell it, but is not the slightest bit appreciated? Oh, wow. This is a very difficult question to answer. Um, I think, yes, when we, when we put our heart into our teaching um, and, and our students somehow they don't see it, and I, they don't uh, appreciate our hard work. Um, it's sad in a way, of course, but I think that um, if I were you in that case, then I would stick to what Dewey and Rogers call directness. I will keep be confident about what I have been doing because I believe that I have put in a lot of effort and, and I put my heart into my work. Um, it doesn't really matter if, if that is being appreciative um, because all I want to aim for is that my students are, are able to achieve the learning outcomes that I would like them to achieve. If I can enable them to achieve the learning outcomes, whether or not that is appreciated, it doesn't really matter for me. If we have that attitude in mind, I believe, then it can help us to um, to become more confident um, in, in our teaching. Um, we don't have to teach uh, in order to look for appreciation. Yes, of course, appreciation is important. Um, and we can, we, we always claim everybody needs praises and appreciation. But if not, then, then it, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that we are not doing a good job, right? Okay. Um, the next question is, um, keeping a journal is one of the ways that you suggested for several How about teaching journals can be full of fasc fasc fascinating yet unsubstantiated insights that prevent the teacher from choosing what to write next. What do you think? Um, preventing teacher from choosing what to write next. Oh, I see what you mean. So when you write a journal, then um, you may not just write what you see, right? Is that what you were trying to ask? I hope that I understood your questions correctly. Um, I think that um, having um, the guided questions suggested by the, um, the ELT experts might um, help you to, um, might, might, it might be a good idea to help you to like direct your thoughts and decide what you should write in, in your journal. Um, talking about that, I'm going to share with you the, um, the free resource that I mentioned uh, in my thought about the, um, the Google Forms, the guided questions, the checklist of good teaching practices via the chat box. Mm. Um, so I have to share that file via the chat box uh, for everybody. So feel free to um, take it. Um, Zhang Ei, uh, can you help to check if you see the file? Uh, not yet, Ms. Do. Can you please share again? Uh, all right then. Um, Uh, somebody say yes. Somebody okay, say so my base is oh, there. Okay. All right, all right. Thanks a lot. Um, wow, a lot of questions actually. Um, but but I think that is will be enough for today. Maybe the 
the other questions could be answered in the last webinar next Tuesday. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, I don't think we have uh, time yet. Oh, I ran over 20 minutes. Oh my God. Sorry about that. <laughs> Okay, okay, so thank you, Ms. Zhang Tu, for the very motivating and wonderful section today. I believe that lots of you are inspired by her, her section today. So we hope that you all enjoy our webinar today and will be able to apply her ideas to your teaching practice. VUS, your English, your future.